and welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters podcast. I'm your host, Nigel Palmer. And in this week's episode, we are on a mission that will take us all over the UK as we try to discover Britain's rarest woodland wild plants. And we get all poetically driven by the stunning spring mornings in this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments. But first, let's head over to the news desk for the very latest wildlife stories we have to share with you on this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News. Hello and welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News, where we were shocked to hear the news on the 21st of July that Captain Paul Watson, a prominent figure in marine conservation, was arrested upon arrival in Nuuk in Greenland. His arrest has significant implications for the future of marine conservation efforts. As the co-founder of marine conservation Greenpeace, founder of Sea Shepherd and currently with the Captain Paul Watson Foundation. He was on board his 72 metre flagship, the MY John Paul de Jura. The vessel stopped in Greenland with 25 volunteer crew members to refuel en route to the Northwest Passage as part of the Captain Paul Watson Foundation Operation Kangi Maru, a mission to intercept Japan's newly built factory whaling ship Kangai Maru in the North Pacific. The leader of the Danish Federal Police boarding party said, We were here and have arrested Paul due to an international arrest order from Japan. The crew were given no further information. The arrest is related to a former red notice issued for Captain Watson's previous anti-whaling interventions in the Antarctic region. In 2014, the International Court of Justice declared Japan's Antarctic research whaling program, known as JAPA, as illegal. We were surprised as the red notice had disappeared a few months ago. We didn't know it, whether it had been erased or made confidential. But now we understand that Japan made it confidential to lure Paul into a false sense of security, stated Lockie McLean, Ship Operations Director for the CPWF. We implore the Danish government to release Captain Watson and not entertain this politically motivated request said McLean. Wildlife Matters supports the call to release Captain Paul Watson immediately. And this week we also have the big butterfly count that's ongoing. 30 years ago you wouldn't have seen a holly blue in Scotland. Now it has expanded where it lives across the UK by 34%, increasing spreading northward. Or the Red Admiral, once a migratory species most commonly seen in southern England in the summer and then leaving for Europe in the winter, is now living in the UK all year round, resulting in a threefold increase in their numbers. And we're seeing other species which have previously suffered severe declines, such as the comma, recovering with a massive increase of 94% of where it is found. These highly adaptable species can move into new places as the climate warms, but these trends raise serious red flags for habitat-specific species. Species that rely on particular habitats can't move as freely as our garden favourites. So, if climate change continues, they could become trapped in isolated fragments of remaining habitat, unable to move and with their food plants at risk from adverse weather conditions. That means they'll face the real threat of extinction. Butterfly Conservation's Big Butterfly Count is not just a project, it's the largest citizen science project of its kind. It offers a positive action 
everyone can take to help collect important scientific data while also enjoying time outdoors, connecting with nature and, most importantly, having fun. Whether done with friends and family or in a quiet, calm and solitude, the Big Butterfly Count is free fun and it, and it takes just 15 minutes. It's open to anyone of any age in any part of the UK, whether you're in a town, a city or out in the countryside. To participate, spend 15 minutes in a green space of your choice, count the butterflies you see and submit your findings online. And no green space is too small. It could be a back garden, a small terrace or a balcony with some pots. A public park, an allotment or a country lane are all important spaces to explore, track and report on. Last year, more than 135,000 counts took place up and down the country, with participants spending almost four years counting butterflies. Wow! The information gathered has helped scientists understand how butterflies and moths are faring, informs conservation projects and government policies, and supports other experts with their research and vital work to protect the planet. This year's Big Butterfly Count runs all the way until Sunday the 4th of August. So you have plenty of time to participate and to do your count. To get started, simply visit www.bigbutterflycount.org or download the free app Big Butterfly Count. And most importantly, enjoy counting your butterflies. Our third and final story on this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News is water for wildlife. We all know staying hydrated is essential, not only for people and our companion animals, but also for our gardens and plants. However, don't forget about the wildlife. The lack of water leads to dehydration for all wildlife, including birds, insects and endangered species like hedgehogs. Households are encouraged to provide water for animals outside their homes during hot weather, where creatures like foxes, hedgehogs, birds, bees and wasps all benefit from having access to water. Wildlife Matters are Water for Wildlife campaign social media posts advocating water for wildlife have had our supporters sharing some really great tips and helpful advice such as placing shallow sources of water in your garden, on your balcony, in any outdoor space you have. Another comment suggested keeping the water sources in the same place so the animals can find them easily and reducing the risk of them being jumped by predators such as cats in the case of some birds. And Wildlife Matters recommends using shallow dishes with gravel and small stones to help the birds and insects drink water safely and enable them to get out should they fall in. But water for wildlife isn't just for warm days. Providing water for wildlife all year round is essential, as water can also be hard to find in a frozen winter garden. And that has been this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News. And now it's time to spend some mindful moments in nature and flash back to the dawn chorus of 2024 that inspired me to write this. The coming day shall gather haste to sleep till late would be a waste. While counting tiny blessings sweet, my soaring heart will skip a beat. A gentle whisper up on high to allow cawing in the sky, the neighbourhood that may have echoed from the haunted wood. Loud drumming from old chisel head will resonate from branches dead, a sunspot 
in a field of grey, screams betrayed to the artful jay. Refined minstrels clad in scarlet breasts will seek to join in with the rest, while sparrows chatter overhead, a scream denotes the vixen's plight, whilst the owl bids good day to the night. From lofty perch to tinkling ditch, the chorus reaches a fever pitch. These golden songs of precious love rain down from the trees above. Each note is disappearing fast, and all at once the moments passed. While a sunny smile on display, I'm ready to face another day. Well, I hope you enjoyed the sound of a dawn chorus I recorded in May 2024. The spring mornings moved me more than ever this year. Now, for those who'd like to identify the birds on the recording, here they are. They were the great tit, wren, grey partridge, chiffchaff, greater white throat, a blackbird and a garden warbler. And that has been this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments. After visiting a local nature reserve and discovering that I had found and pictured a rare wild flower, I thought that looking at some of the rarest wildflowers in Britain's woodlands would make an exciting adventure for us to share. And this search has taken me to many woodlands, nature reserves and even private woods throughout the UK. Each has been fascinating and wonderful, but only some visits have been successful. However, I have managed to discover more of the achingly rare wild plants around Britain. So join me as we search for rare, often endangered wild plants with curious life cycles, secretive habits and very particular needs. The first plant on our search is now an island native. As far as I know, it isn't on the British mainland at all. It's called wood calamint or Clinopodium menthifolium. As I set off to catch the ferry to the Isle of Wight, I wondered if I would be fortunate enough to find the elusive wood colour mint. And if I did, would I be able to identify it? This scarce plant is similar to the common colour mint, which is reasonably easy to find in Britain. And the differences are slight unless you happen to be a trained botanist, which I'm not. First, we need to check the petals, which can be up to 25 mil or nearly double the length of the common calamint. And then we would need to look at the leaves. Oh yes, the leaves. Let me check to be sure. Yes, the leaves are longer, can be up to six centimetres, whilst the common calamint leaves only grow to around four centimetres. We will then have to check the number of teeth on the edge of the leaf. 
and ideally we'd be looking for 10 or more as the common calamint has a maximum of eight. But that wasn't everything, oh no. To be sure, I had found wood calamint. I would need to check the corollas, which are much longer and, as a final check, would need to look under the leaves for the purple spots that both plants have but the wood calamint has a more prominent purple spots. However, this is very subjective, especially if you're only looking at one of the plant species. Although a woodland edge plant, wood calamint is now found in hedgerows and scrubland. This shift is a testament to the plant's adaptability, a quality that never fails to inspire me. It also reflects the loss of its original woodland habitat due to human activities. On the plus side is that in common with the other mint family plants, I would be sure I had found one of the calamints simply by rubbing a leaf between my fingers and inhaling that beautiful minty smell. Back in the 1950s, the wood calamint was virtually extinct due to the loss of its woodland habitat and its need to grow on calcareous or chalky soils. Only five patches of wood calamint were said to remain on the Isle of Wight until locals took up the challenge to save the plants themselves. Their effort, an early form of citizen science, played a crucial role in conserving the species. I like it when people act to protect their local flora and fauna. Today, although restricted to the small area of the island, wood calamint does appear each summer. Although rare and endangered, most of the calamint choose to bloom along a roadside verge that runs alongside a local woodland. It always makes me smile when you set off on an adventure and find the locals just going about their daily business or walking their dog, with these rare plants being no more than a colourful addition to the roadside verge. As with many things in nature, Timing is crucial, and I had it right as I walked the remote country lanes, enjoying the sight and smell of these unique wild plants. Our next adventure is a visit to an old, wet woodland area in the west of England. This is the perfect habitat to find today's rare woodland wild plant. Yellow bird's nest. Monotropa hypopites. Yellow bird's nest only emerges from the soil to flower. It is another plant that is very much all about timing. Yellow bird's nest was thought to be a parasitic plant and it has no leaves. It shares many traits in fact with fungi as it proliferates in flowers above the soil although flowers may not be the best description of this plant, fruiting bodies would be better. It doesn't look like a mushroom, but it sure does act like one. It resembles asparagus, in fact, as it has a spear-like form that can grow up to 30 centimetres tall. But ideally, you should be looking for it when it's around half that size. When it isn't fertile, the flower heads always hang down towards the ground in the shape of an umbrella. It grows in several short telescopic-like sections, something like um, the old-style car aerials, if you're old enough to remember them. But still, these are scale-like leaves and can be up to 13 mil long. Yellow bird's nest was considered as a saprophyte, a parasitic plant that gets its nutrition by feeding off dead or dying organic matter. Today though, we know that yellow bird's nest is in fact a heterotroph, which means it is plugged in to the mycorrhizal network underground, just like fungi. That term stems from Greek words hetero for other and trophy for nourishment. It is classified as vulnerable and in decline. Sadly, I couldn't find it on this visit, 
and due to its fleeting appearance above ground, I will have to wait until next year before I can return to try it again. The next on our plant hunter list is perhaps the most challenging plant to find in the whole of Britain. And I'm told that very few people have ever seen the elusive ghost orchid or Epigogium aphilium. The ghost orchid is as beautiful as it is elusive and was declared officially extinct in Britain back in 2005. It's a pale, diminutive plant that can be dormant in the soil for more than 30 years between flowering on any one site. So this will be a massive challenge and possibly a very long podcast episode. Excitingly, the ghost orchid was found again in 2009, but since then there have been very few sightings. So, acting on a very reliable tip-off, I decided to make the trip to the old shady woodland. The word was that ghost orchids had just appeared above the soil. How exciting! The ghost orchid often appears only once in any given location. They prefer ancient beech and oak woodlands, but recently they have been found in established pine and spruce woodlands that have a rich soil base, meaning that they would have been there for centuries. You see, the new pine or spruce plantations that may be there for 80 years before harvest are too young and too infertile for a ghost orchid. Ghost orchids don't use sunlight to produce chlorophyll through their leaves like most plants. In fact, ghost orchids do not have leaves. It was thought that ghost orchids were saprophytic, meaning that they absorb their nutrients from dead or decaying organic matter. However, today we know that these plants are obligate mycoheterotrophic, which means they depend on fungi to obtain their nutrients from the mycorrhizal networks. And as a result, these carbon metabolites usually lose chlorophyll. The mycorrhizal networks in turn rely on a symbiotic relationship with the roots of various species of deciduous and coniferous trees. So, ghost orchids only grow from an underground burrowing stem which lacks chlorophyll. The branch has ephemeral leaves that are actually small scales and to add to the mystery, it's generally only found after a wet summer. So, in our climate change affected world, the sightings are likely to be even less frequent and more elusive than they were in the past. Ghost orchids have the highest protection possible throughout Europe, even for scientific studies. These plants are scarce and should never be removed from their habitat or disturbed. You see, the ghost orchid cannot be cultivated outside of laboratory conditions as they require specific fungal symbionts and specific host trees with which these species form mycorrhizal relationships. On the plus side, those lucky enough to have seen ghost orchids talk of tall plants with multiple flower stalks, each one bearing three or four flowers that create a stunning visual display. You probably won't be surprised to know that we could not find the elusive ghost orchid on this visit, but I am determined to return and follow up all other leads to see the incredible bloom of ghost orchids one day. Our next adventure of discovery is to find another elusive orchid species that, fortunately for me, is usually found much closer to home. And that is the red helleborine, or Cephalanthria rubra. Now it's thought that there were only 30 individual red helleborine plants surviving in the UK. 
Firstly, though, let me clarify that the plant we are looking for today is an orchid, not a hellebore. How plants are named can be confusing because hellebores are a completely different plant species. A little bit of checking and I found that the name comes from an ancient Greek word and means like a hellebore, which isn't that helpful. They have been found in broadleaf woodlands with thick canopies that provide plenty of shade as they don't like too much sunlight. And they also don't like competition from other plants, preferring to be on their own in chalky, free draining soil. They are considered critically endangered in Britain and they're vulnerable throughout their whole range within Europe. As far as I know, they can only be found on three sites in the south of England. And I'm heading to one of those sites today. But I want to be clear that these orchids are difficult to spot even when they are in flower. Most of the time, they only have leaves showing, making it them even more challenging to distinguish from the other long-leaved woodland plants. And these are quirky plants. Their delicate pink flowers don't produce a nectar. Instead, they attract pollinators by their colour. But the primary pollinator is a bee species, which is not present in Britain. There are so many questions about this plant, and how is it even here? It's like the bee orchid. Botanists continue investigating how the plant reproduces in this country. Red helleborine orchids can grow up to 60 centimetres in height and have slender, wavy looking stems with seven to ten flowers. The greyish green leaves are long and narrow. After many hours scouring the ground for leaves that look similar to so many others, I finally spotted a dark purplish stem with three pointed pink flowers with, that had white edges and the central display that reminded me of a bat's face. Excitedly, I called my friends to come and see and they confirmed that we had indeed found the red helleborine. Relief and another of Britain's rarest wild plants found and pictured. And so we enthusiastically and excitedly moved on to the next adventure. The best place to find the next rare woodland wild plant is generally along the English Welsh borders, but today I am visiting one of a few sites in southern England where they have been known and recorded. Today we're looking for the spreading bellflower or Campanula patula. Now I can already hear the gardeners amongst you saying, Campanula or bellflowers, they're not rare. You can find them in many nurseries and garden centres and they would be right. You can. But we are looking for Campanula patula, a native wildflower to Britain. While most of our finds are garden escapees, there remains a small native wild population. The spreading bellflower was named after the way its petals spread. This plant needs disturbed soils to germinate, although it is unclear why. The careful management of woodlands in the past, though, through coppicing and selective thinning, was vital to the survival of this delicate wildflower. It appears in different areas of the woodland each year, but it is always on a sunny woodland edge. Although it is considered an annual wildflower, it is in fact a biennial. The leaves are crowded at the bottom of the long stems where they are sparse. Upon opening, the flowers are the classic campanula bell shape, but the petals soon spread wide, which is how the plant got its name. Although the spreading bellflower is endangered and at high risk of extinction in Britain, I found it growing in abundance on a sunny woodland edge adjoining an old meadow. The next plant we are looking for has an unpleasant name, one that I hope will not offend. For today, we are looking for 
bastard balm, Meletis melissifolium. Now, I'm curious to know how this plant got such a bad name. You see, plant names generally reflect the look or use. So you would imagine a plant with this name would be something that was deadly poisonous or similar. But in reality, this is a pretty plant with a pleasant scent that produces plenty of nectar for pollinating insects. It's not poisonous or associated with witchcraft, which is often the source of a plant's name. It's a mystery. But please let me know in the comments if anyone can tell me how this plant got its name. It is a member of the mint family and is a shade loving plant that thrives in coppiced woodlands and along the hedgerows. Its strong scent attracts pollinators who are guided to the rich nectar by the bright pink tongue on the bottom edge of each flower. Here in England, the flowers are pink to purple with a white edge and look pretty similar to a sweet pea type flower. But over in Europe and in France in particular, the flowers are entirely pink. And there's another mystery. Bastard balm is now scarce in Britain with the main population in Devon and Cornwall. It is threatened by habitat loss, mainly due to the loss of hedgerows and our older woodlands. Traditionally, the plant's leaves and flowers were used to make herbal teas, tinctures and ointments that were said to help ease respiratory conditions such as asthma and bronchitis. It was also said to clean the kidneys and to help relieve anxiety. And I was lucky enough to discover several patches along a woodland edge and I have used my pictures in the blog post. In fact, if you want to, please do go to our website www.awildlife-matters.org and look up the post Britain's Rarest Plants Part 1 and you will see pictures of all the plants we found and even the ones we didn't obviously not my pictures on the blog post. Now, this adventure has taken me far longer than I anticipated to share with you, so I've decided to make this podcast into a two-part mini-series. We have many more rare and fascinating plants to find, or not, on this adventure. Still for now, I will say goodbye as you leave me on the edge of an ancient woodland, just enjoying the late afternoon sun. But I will return with part two of Britain's rarest woodland plants on the next Wildlife Matters podcast. Well, I hope you enjoyed our adventure to find, or not, some of the rarest wild plants in the UK. We want to try different things here on the Wildlife Matters podcast and it would be good to know if you enjoyed the walk and talk type of storytelling. Please let us know in the comments or drop us an email. Our email address is info at wildlife-matters.org. We have received some excellent feedback on Matt Somerville's wild honeybee work at Maple Farm Rewilding Project that we featured on the last episode of the Wildlife Matters podcast. Many of you, like us, were not aware of natural beekeeping and all of its benefits. We will be going back to Maple Farm Rewilding Project in the future and are planning to share more about wildlife and nature projects or work that is just a little different with you all very soon. But if you have or are working on a project that you think would be of interest to our community, then please do let us know by emailing us at the address, which is once again, info at wildlife-matters.org. Now we are running out of time again and we have so much to share. So please do like and subscribe and leave us a comment wherever you get your podcasts and share this episode with a friend or colleague who may enjoy it. Thank you.
Wildlife Matters will return in two weeks' time. But until then, I've been your host, Nigel Palmer, and this is Wildlife Matters, signing off.